Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kari and today I'm going to be talking about my favorite books of 2022. I'm actually going to be telling you my top seven of 2022 and then three honorable mentions because while I really enjoyed these three honorable mention books, it just doesn't feel right to call them my favorite books of the year with the other seven because those seven are going to be added to my list of my favorite books of all time. Whereas these three, even though I really enjoyed them, they're not going to be my favorite books of all time, even though, like I said, I really like them. So that means I'm going to be doing my top seven favorite books of 2022 instead of a top 10. While I had some really good reads in 2022, it was nothing compared to my reading in 2021. I know that every year of reading can't be perfection, but in 2021, I read so many books that became favorite books of all time that it's kind of depressing that I could only make a top seven this year of books that are gonna become my favorite books of all time. But like I said, every year can't be perfection and all I can do is try to have a really good reading year in 2023. But if you're interested in knowing what those books are that I read in 2021, that so many of them became favorite books of all time, I'll link that video down below in the description box so that you can check it out because I read, like I said, some of my favorite books I've ever read in 2021. So like House of Leaves, The Secret History, Piranesi, Clara and the Sun, like so many books that I read in 2021 were just so freaking good that my expectations were just really high in 2022 and it didn't really meet those expectations, but that's okay. The, these seven books are Excellent. With all that out of the way, let's jump into my top seven books of 2022. I'm gonna start with book number seven and then work my way to my favorite book of the year. And then I'll talk about a few of my honorable mentions. My seventh favorite book of the year was Pretty Girls by Karen Slaughter. This is a thriller that's darker than any thriller I've ever read before. And I read a lot of thrillers. It's about a woman who gets married and then shortly after their marriage, her husband dies. And then she starts to learn some really dark and disturbing secrets about her husband. I would not recommend this for people who don't read thrillers very often, but if you're a really big thriller fan and you read thrillers pretty often and you aren't afraid of some pretty graphic, violent content, I would totally recommend this book. I had always heard people say that this is like the darkest thriller that they've ever read. And I was like, yeah, okay. They probably don't read thrillers very often. You know, it's not gonna be that dark to me because I read so many thrillers. No, <laughs> this is super dark. And that's why I wouldn't recommend it to somebody who doesn't read thrillers very often because you're gonna be, shocked. But yeah, those people are spot on when they say that this is the darkest thriller I've ever read. I thought it was so well done. And even though it's kind of long for a thriller, I mean, the font in this is pretty small. It kept me turning the pages and I wanted to know what was going to happen. And there were multiple twists and I just really enjoyed this. So if you're a thriller fan, would definitely recommend this. My sixth favorite book this year was The Lost Daughter by Elena Ferrante. This is literary fiction in translation from the Italian. I usually have a really hard time like really connecting to short books and loving short books, but this one is very short and obviously I really love this book. It follows a single mom who has two adult age daughters and we follow her as she goes on vacation to the beach by herself and she becomes like enamored with these two other families. These two families are on vacation together. She becomes enamored with them and watching them when they're on the beach because it's kind of like a resort. Like you see the same people on the beach every day during your vacation and because she keeps seeing these same people on the beach every day, she becomes kind of obsessed with this mom and daughter and she starts to think about them even when she's at home, when she's not around them. She's thinking about them when she goes home at night and she starts to question what kind of mom she's been. Has she been a good mom to her daughters? Because you know, she's observing this mother daughter relationship on the beach every day. It does take kind of like a psychological turn at one point and it gets not weird, not like traditionally weird, but a little bit strange. Now, it's not like a thriller or horror or anything like that. It is still literary fiction. So don't, don't expect something super dramatic, but something a little bit strange does start to happen with her and her psychological state, but it's just a really interesting character study of this woman who has doubts about how she's been a mom. And it's just really interesting to look at the psychology of this woman. I would recommend this book for anyone who enjoys those no plot, just vibe stories, or for people who enjoy reading about like the psychology of mothers and about women who maybe regret being moms or aren't sure if they want to be moms, that type of story, those types of themes. I really enjoyed this. And like I said, I was really surprised how much I love this because it's pretty short. My fifth favorite book, of 2022 is You Deserve Nothing by Alexander Maxik. This is a literary fiction that's told from three points of view. The main point of view is a male teacher who teaches at an international high school in Paris. The second point of view is a male student in that teacher's class. And the third point of view is from a female student at that school, but she's not in that teacher's class. We learn from all these different perspectives that this teacher, this main point of view teacher is super respected, really loved at this international school. All the students want to be in his class. And the point of view that we get from 
the male student who is in that teacher's class, we learn that the students really go above and beyond to try to make him proud of them because they really look up to him and they really want him to be proud of them. So it's really reinforced how much these students love this teacher and how highly respected he is at this school. But then you'll remember there's the third point of view of a female student at that school, but she's not in this teacher's class. We learn fairly early on that the teacher is having a relationship, I use air quotes here because you can't be in a relationship with a minor, he's in a relationship with this female student. So this is just a super fascinating character study about how people are not always what they seem to be. Because obviously, like I said, this teacher is widely respected at the school, loved, all the students want to be in his class, but then we find out about this very, very dark secret that he has. So if you enjoy character studies, especially character studies with some pretty dark themes, I would definitely recommend this to you. I do want to say that after I finished this, I learned on Goodreads that this book is kind of semi-autobiographical of the author, because the author used to be a teacher at an international high school in Paris, and he had a huge air quotes here, relationship with one of his students. So obviously I think that's super repulsive that this author is benefiting financially off of this horrible thing that he's done in his life. Luckily I bought this copy second hand because obviously I didn't learn about all that until I finished the book, but luckily I did buy this second hand. So therefore he didn't benefit financially off of me buying a copy of this book. So just keep that in mind if you're interested in this book, but maybe you don't want to support the author financially. I know that's up to you, you decide for yourself. Well, obviously I don't love that this is semi-autobiographical, I can't deny how much I really loved this character study and it's really fascinating how it examines how people are not always what they seem to be. My fourth favorite book of the year was Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. This is literary fiction that was long listed and then short listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction this year. And I hadn't heard anybody talk about this book before it was long listed. And I really love to follow the Women's Prize for Fiction. So when I looked up all the books that had been long listed, this one sounded so good and I'm so glad that I picked it up. So like I said, this did go on to be short listed listed and I'm really sad that it ended up not winning the Ruth Ozeki one instead, which means that that Ruth Ozeki must be really good because this book, incredible. I love this so much and I'm so thankful to the Women's Prize for Fiction to bringing this to my attention because wow, this was so good. So anyway, this is about a 40 something year old woman who's struggling to be happy in her marriage and she's just generally having a really hard time in her life. She's really struggling with her mental health and all the relationships in her life. So her husband, her best friend, her sister, all these different people in her life, she's really struggling to have good relationships with these people because of her mental health. She just finds everyone in her life absolutely insufferable, even these people that she shouldn't be finding insufferable, like her sister. So like I said, she's really suffering with her mental health and we even get little flashbacks back to her like teenage years. And we learn that people kind of blew her off when she was having mental health problems at this time and didn't really take her seriously. And so we see how in the today timeline, how that's affecting her, that she was never taught how to cope with this and how to start to heal from these issues that she has. I just have to say that the writing in this is insane. It's so good, so beautiful, so witty, so smart. Like I read this pretty slowly because I just wanted to take in every single word. Like it's so beautiful, I love this. And it's, it's just so smart. The writing is hilarious, but beautiful at the same time. Also just something else about this story is that I don't read romance. That's not something that really interests me. And actually if there's ever like a romance, like side plot in any of the stories that I'm reading, like I don't really care if there's a sad ending. Like I love sad endings in books, but in this story, I was rooting for her to have a happy ending and that never happened. So like, like that's how much this book affected me that I was rooting for a happy ending when I'm always rooting for a sad ending. Like I love a freaking sad ending and I was rooting for her to have a happy ending. Like that never happened. So that just tells you how powerful this book was for me. This actually has a lot of similar themes to The Lost Daughter by Elena Ferrante that I mentioned a little bit ago. So if you've read and liked The Lost Daughter, I would recommend this and vice versa because the themes are quite similar. I would recommend this book for people who enjoy those that girl books because this is like a really smart, witty, that girl book. I just want to share three of my favorite quotes from this book because like I said, the writing is just so on point. I got one book out from the library, an Ian McEwan that I thought was a novel and put it in a drawer when I realized it was short stories. I called Ingrid and told her I had accidentally invested in two characters who would be dead in 16 pages. She said, seriously, who has the time? He asked me what I've been reading. I had been reading nothing and said Jane Eyre. <laughs> I said goodbye and it wasn't enough. One word, too quotidian to contain the end of the world, but it was all there was. Like, ugh, 
it's so beautiful and like those witty lines like i had been reading nothing and said jane eyre like <laughs> i love that next my third favorite book of the year is actually four books in a series and if you've been around my channel the last few months you're probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but it's the A Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin. So I read four of the five books that have been published. Obviously, we're still waiting on The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring, but <laughs> who knows if we'll ever get that? So anyway, I read A Game of Thrones, A Clash of Kings, A Storm of Swords, and A Feast for Crows this year. So I'm just gonna hold this first one in the series because it's too much to hold off four of those. They're pretty heavy. So these books are actually the only books that I read after July that are on this list. So that tells you how top heavy my reading was in 2022 that almost all of my favorite books of last year I read before July. <laughs> That's so depressing. <laughs> but anyway, a Song of Ice and Fire. The only thing that saved the second half of my 2022. <laughs> so I decided to lump these four books together rather than putting them in four different places on my list because I thought it would be kind of boring if I just talk about the same book series four different times. So just know I'm talking about all four of these books. I loved all of them equally. So freaking good. Although I guess I could have filled out a top 10 if I had put them separately, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So obviously this is the book series that the HBO series Game of Thrones is based on. But to my surprise, after book like two, the series takes like a right turn and changes so many different things. And by book four, A Feast for Crows, things are very different than the TV show. So it's really interesting to see the choices that they made in the show, what they chose to change. So I actually binged Game of Thrones in 2017 before the eighth season aired. And then I watched the eighth season live with everybody. And then I obviously didn't start the books until 2022. So for years, I only ever had show canon to go off of. And I thought that that was everything. And I thought there were so many characters. I thought there were so many locations, so many fake words. I just thought it was like the most complex thing ever. And then I got to the books oh my god there's so many more characters than are in the show so many characters i'm reading a book right now that's a non-fiction about a song of ice and fire and like the making of the game of thrones tv show and they said that there are over 2,000 named characters in the a song of ice and fire book series over 2,000 named characters. They said that Tolkien only has like 1,000 named characters in the Lord of the Rings series. 2,000 characters. So yeah, that's been something that's been really interesting to navigate and to keep straight while I'm reading, but it's like a super fun challenge to keep everything straight and to keep all the different storylines and pieces of lore straight. Like, I love that. It's been so fun. I've been watching so many like theory videos on YouTube where people theorize about what's going to happen in the next two books if we ever get them and it's so fun to watch and theorize because George R. R. Martin puts so much lore and like I said characters and places and so much history it's like hundreds and hundreds thousands of years of history that are explained in these books plus the like world book and fire and blood for example that there's just so much history and lore that you could speculate forever and these people on YouTube they do speculate forever and I'm there for every single minute <laughs> But I just think that that adds to the experience. Like that makes reading the books so much more fun since you can speculate just forever about what he gives you. And since the books are so different from what the show did, I feel like I'm getting a completely new story, which makes it even more fun. Like I don't feel bored at all because it feels like a different story. My obsession with the series has also been intensified by the fact that House of the Dragon came out this year. And oh my God, it was so freaking good. If you loved House of the Dragon, please talk to me about it in the comments. Like I need to talk about it. <laughs> so yeah, basically with the combination of reading this series this year and watching House of the Dragon. I feel like I live in Westeros at this point, which has been really fun. All that to say, I have loved reading this series and I cannot wait to get to A Dance with Dragons this year and then hopefully sometime soon we'll get The Winds of Winter. I'm already impatient for it and I haven't even read A Dance with Dragons yet. I cannot imagine the people who read A Dance with Dragons in 2011 when it came out, like how long they've had to wait. <laughs> I cannot imagine like I understand how people get so mad at George R. R. Martin like I mean he doesn't owe us anything but I understand how frustrating that would be because I haven't even read the next book and I'm already looking forward to it anyway I'm going to shut up about it now but just know that I have never read fantasy before in my whole life and I'm absolutely obsessed with this series and I can't wait to read more of it all right guys my second favorite book of the year was Bunny by Mona Awad I love this book as far as genre goes I don't even know what to tell you. It's like a cross between horror and literary fiction, kind of, question mark. I don't know. 
It's weird. The genre is weird. So this follows Samantha, who's a university student in a writing program. And this writing program is super small. The majority of the other students in this program are all best friends and they are the bunnies hence the name. Like they call each other Bunny. It's their little stupid nickname that they have for each other. And these girls are like the cliche, annoying, popular, girly girls, you know? And Samantha hates these girls, like passionately hates them and makes fun of them to her best friend all the time, like nonstop makes fun of them. Because just the way that these girls talk to each other, like it's so saccharine and stupid and like they just sound dumb, like cliche, stupid popular girls, you know, like it's very cliched like that. But then one day the bunnies invite Samantha to go hang out with them and Samantha accepts. And so Samantha's best friend is like, what are you doing? Don't you hate them? Like you make fun of them all the time. Why would you go hang out with them? But Samantha goes anyway. And what happens next it's a fucking wild ride, let me tell you. I don't want to say too much because just experience it for yourself. I mean, really incredible. <laughs> it just gets very culty, ritualistic, magical realism. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just weird, but freaking awesome. I tore through this book and when I couldn't be reading it, I was thinking about when is the next time I can pick it up again and keep reading because I have to know what's gonna happen. The writing is just so smart and witty and funny. I loved the writing. The ending is actually kind of ambiguous, which I know some people don't like. Personally, I loved it. I reread the ending twice because I was like, did I understand that right? And then when I read it again, I was like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I think I understood that right. I really like that you can interpret that ending the way that you want to interpret it, kind of, which, like I said, I understand why some people wouldn't like that. So if you don't like ambiguous endings, steer clear of this, you're not gonna like it. But I thought it was really, really fun. This isn't something that's very easy to recommend because like I said, it is very weird and I don't think a lot of people would like that. And also the open-endedness of the ending, I think a lot of people don't like that in stories. So if either of those things sound like a turn off to you, don't bother. But if the plot does sound slightly interesting to you, definitely give it a try. It's so worth it. It's just so good and so fun, so witty. I'm really looking forward to reading Mono Awad's All's Well that came out this past year. And in September, she just announced that she's gonna release another book. And I'm really excited for that as well. So more Mono Awad in 2023, definitely. I want to share three quotes with you that just show the deadpan humor of this book. This is Samantha. Samantha, the Duchess repeats loudly as if talking to someone who is nearly deaf or foreign or five. We've read Jane Eyre too, you and we've read The Waves. And when we read it, you know, we cried for minutes. <laughs> I hope you don't mind this music, he says. No, I want to take the CD and throw it out the window, possibly setting it on fire first. <laughs> I just love it. Like it's like deadpan humor, you know what I mean? So good, but definitely recommend. And finally, my favorite book of 2022. This was actually the first book that I read in 2022. So, I mean, it all went downhill from there. <laughs> but it's A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. I purposely made this my first read of the year to maximize the sadness that I felt. Because since it was January, the dead of winter, it's cold, the sun sets at 4.30, like ultimate sadness vibes. I was trying to make this as sad as possible. What does that say about me that I tried to make a little life even sadder? <laughs> Anyway, you've probably heard a million people talk about this book, but I just have to add to the praise because wow, this book deserves all the praise that it gets. It's truly beautiful. This follows the main character Jude and then three of his friends and also kind of like his adoptive father figure. Before I read this book, I always heard people say that this book follows all four friends. In reality, it's more about Jude and then one other friend and the other two friends kind of fade into the background after the beginning of the book. So just know that it's not really about all four characters, it's mostly about Jude. Jude has lived an extremely, understatement of the century, extremely traumatic life. And through the course of the book, we learn more and more about his traumatic past, what has happened to him, and in the current timeline, how is that traumatic past affecting him still today? People are not exaggerating when they say that this is the saddest book they've ever read. Like, I personally go out of my way to find sad books. Those are my favorite books, sad books. Like, if people say it's a sad book, buy, add to cart, like, give it to me. <laughs> so that's why I was so eager to read this and see, okay, is this really gonna be as sad as people say it is? It's as sad as people say it is. 
most of these books on my top seven books of 2022 are sad, depressing, dark theme books, but none of them come even close to this. But I fucking loved it. It's so good. It's so profound. It's not just sad to be sad. I mean, some people think it's sad just to be sad, which I don't agree. I think that this book is so beautiful and so profound and the writing we have to talk about the writing. The writing is insane. Hanya Yonagahara is a master with words. You never realize what good writing is until you read something like this. You don't realize what you're missing out on writing-wise, poetic, beautiful writing is, until you read something like this. You're like, wow, this is writing. This is what writing is all about. It's so beautiful and poetic. Even though the content is so sad, she makes it sound so beautiful. I was like 25% of the way through this when I pre-ordered her 2022 release to Paradise. Like it was about to come out when I was reading this. And so I pre-ordered it because I was like, I need more Hanya Yanagahara writing in my life ASAP. Like this is not gonna be enough, I need more. Something else that I really like about this book is that it's very layered. Things that are mentioned at the beginning of the book come back to be important at the end of the book. Multiple things are like this. And I just love that in my stories. Actually, that's something that I really appreciate about A Song of Ice and Fire is, you know, George R. R. Martin, he calls himself the gardener when he's writing. Like he plants little seeds at the beginning and then they grow into something else that is important later. And that's very much what's happening in this book. Little seeds are planted at the beginning of the story that end up being very important by the end. I also really like the jumps forwards and backwards in time. Like we jump back to the past to learn about this traumatic history of Jude and then we jump back to the present day and each time that we flash back you know we get a little bit more and more information about the past and she just gives you just enough information that it leaves you questioning and wanting to know more but she just gives you this little bit and it makes you want to look forward to the next flashback scene to learn even more even though obviously it's very hard to read but you just want to put all the puzzle pieces together also I just have to say that before I read this book I always wondered what does the title mean a little life and when I tell you, when you find out what a little life comes from, why it's the title, oh my God, so painful. Yeah, so you don't really think about too much what does the title mean, but it hurts when you find out what it means. Like I said, I was one of those people that went into this book like, oh, you know, everybody says that they cry when they read this book. I'm not gonna cry. I love sad books. I read sad books all the time. You know, there's no way I'm gonna cry. Yeah, jokes on me. I fucking bawled my eyes out multiple times reading this book. I even took a picture of myself right when I read the last page of this book just to commemorate how fucking sad I was. No, I'm not gonna show you the picture. It's embarrassing, but it was just for me to remember how much this book moved me. And that's what I love in a book. I want a book to make me feel something and Holy shit, did this book make me feel something? I can't just openly recommend this book to everybody because like I said, some of the themes are super heavy. So if you're someone that needs to check into content warnings, definitely do that for this book. Every tough theme that you can think of is probably addressed in this book. So I can't just openly recommend it, but if you check the content warnings, if you're not so sure and you're okay with it, wow, I cannot recommend this book more. I absolutely cannot wait to reread this book. So those are my top seven favorite books of 2022. All seven of those, well, technically 10 books, if you include the A Song of Ice and Fire books, they're all going straight to my favorite books of all time list. But like I said, I do want to mention three more books that I really enjoyed this year. They're just not gonna be favorite books of all time, but I did really, really enjoy them and I wanted to shout them out quickly. The first one is My Favorite Thing is Monsters by Emil Ferris, and this is a graphic novel. I read this around Halloween in a Halloween Halloween vlog, so if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this, I'll link that video down below. But basically this follows a 10 year old girl who tries to solve the murder of her upstairs neighbor, who is an older woman who dies in her apartment, and like I said, this little girl tries to solve the murder. I was not expecting for the themes to be so dark and so adult in this book, and I really appreciated that. This is definitely an adult graphic novel, like I said, the themes are very dark, but that's what made me really enjoy this. So I would definitely recommend this to people who already enjoy graphic novels, or if you're looking to get into graphic novels. Novels. And I've already talked a million times about the art in this book, but the art is insanely beautiful. I've never seen a graphic novel so beautiful before, so I would definitely recommend this. The second book in the series was actually supposed to come out earlier this year, but then it didn't come out. And through some research, I actually learned that the release of that book keeps getting pushed back. So it's a big question mark when the next one's gonna be coming out, but whenever it does come out, I'm definitely gonna pick it up and read it. Next is a book that I'm sure you've already heard about a million times before, but I just had to say that I loved I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. And even if you have no idea who Jeanette McCurdy is, you're still gonna like this memoir because I had 
had no idea who she was. I never watched iCarly and I absolutely love this memoir. So if you enjoy reading memoirs, cannot recommend this book enough. And my next honorable mention is This is Vegan Propaganda by Ed Winters. So in November 2021, I read Eating Animals by Jonathan Saffron Foer, which encouraged me to make the change to start to become vegetarian. And then in January of 2022, Ed Winters released this book, which I ended up picking up because I thought it would help me with my transition to vegetarianism. Even though this is about veganism, I thought it would help with my vegetarianism. But the joke is on me because this actually convinced me that vegetarianism is not enough if you care about animals, if you truly care about the well-being of animals, and that if you care about the well-being of animals, you should be vegan. So I won't go into too many details because I know this doesn't interest everybody, but I just wanted to say that if you're interested in going vegetarian or vegan, I would definitely recommend this book. And I would also really recommend Ed Winter's YouTube channel because I didn't know this when I read it actually, that Ed Winters is a YouTuber and he makes some excellent, excellent, excellent videos. I especially love the videos where he goes to university campuses and debates with university students about why they aren't vegan. Sometimes the debates get pretty heated, but it's incredible how calm and collective and informative Ed is. I've just learned so much from watching his videos and obviously from reading this book too, but I cannot recommend this book and also his YouTube channel more if you're interested in making that change in your life. So yeah, those are the seven books that I absolutely love this year that are some of my favorite books of all time now, plus three honorable mentions that I also really enjoyed. Even though I didn't find as many favorite books this year as I did last year, I still absolutely love these books that I mentioned, and I'm so glad that I read them this year. I hope in 2023 I get even more books to add to my favorite books of all time list. In the comments, I would love if you would let me know what your favorite books were this year. I'm always looking for recommendations, so please go tell me in the comments what your favorite books were. I would love to get some recommendations from you. I'd love to hear what your favorite books were books for. If you like this video, please give it a like. I would really, really appreciate it and subscribe if you haven't already. I would love to have you back and I'll talk to you again next time. Bye.